Oh, welcome back to Planet Doug behind the scenes for Saturday, November 26. It's about 8.30 in the morning and I'm walking outside because I wanted to get breakfast and I'm heading towards my favorite McDonald's for breakfast and I'm going there partially because uh, right beside the McDonald's is a nice grocery store and I like to go to this grocery store now to uh, buy all my various staples. I can get these things at stores in my neighborhood, yet I find the experience so unpleasant at almost all of these shops that I've been, I've been locating stores outside my neighborhood. I'd rather walk two kilometers to another neighborhood to go shopping than shop in my own neighborhood. I'm talking about places like, you know, the KK and uh, <clears throat> the little shops in my neighborhood. I just haven't had good experiences on my time you know staying in that neighborhood so I just don't go into them anymore so I'm on I'm outside and I'm walking I think I think better when I'm sitting inside my room talking about the activities of the day before which is what I do mainly in these behind the scenes videos it's better if I'm sitting down and feeling nice and relaxed but I woke up this morning without my usual coffee fixings I've run out so that's why I'm on my way to the grocery store to uh, resupply. And uh, yeah, we'll see if I can gather my thoughts as I walk along. I was telling a story about shopping for sandals the other day and I failed on every front. I was trying to go to a place called Sport Direct to replace my sandals because I've been wearing the exact same brand and style of sandal for many many years there are these adidas black sandals very simple ones very inexpensive but i like them and when my first pair wore out i just went straight back to sport direct and bought the exact same pair just replace them and now that the second pair are wearing out i thought maybe there's a chance that uh, they're still selling you know these exact same sandals and i tried to go to one sport direct Big adventure getting there and it turned out it was uh, closed so the day the next day I hopped on the MRT again and I went to Bukit Bintan to the other uh, sport direct location the one place where I bought all my previous sandals and it was open they carry a lot of a uh, lot of stuff there and they did have a lot of sport sandals inexpensive style you know sport sandals and they still even sold a couple of Adidas branded ones, but uh, I couldn't find the ones that I'd normally buy. They just either don't, Adidas doesn't make them anymore, or this particular chain, Sport Direct, doesn't, uh, doesn't carry them anymore. So anyway, I wasn't able to buy these uh, exact same sandals. And I, they did have others that I could have bought, you know, in the same price range, and I tried on a bunch, but I didn't like any of them. Uh, again, as I've talked about in the past, sometimes small design features are what make a difference for me. And uh, these particular sandals, one reason I like them is because the main strap that goes over your instep, it has a Velcro strap where you can adjust the length of it, but the actual attachment point is a buckle, a typical, you know, fast tech buckle, and you just sort of click it into place, and it's just, it's really fast to put it on and off. That's one of the reasons I like these sandals, but all the ones at Sport Direct that they have now, none of them have the buckle anymore. It's been replaced with only Velcro straps, and I kind of dislike that because it makes a lot of noise, Every single time you bend over to remove your sandals, you know, it's like rip, rip, you know, makes that loud Velcro tearing sound. And you're doing that all day long, you know, over and over again as you take your sandals off. And I just find that a bit annoying. Plus the Velcro in these cheap sandals wears out pretty fast. It just won't, uh, won't attach anymore very strongly. Anyway. Overall, the sandals they had there didn't feel right, so I walked out without anything. And I'm still wearing my aging pair of Adidas. Yeah. I might head down to Mid Valley at some point. Mid Valley 
plaza has a lot of uh, stores there, kind of clothing and some camping equipment stores, things like that. I might be able to uh, pick up a pair of sandals there. A little shopping expedition. And uh, speaking of shopping expedition, that's mainly what I want to talk about today because I went on a major one over the last couple of days. All to do with uh, cameras. The thing is that here in Kuala Lumpur, I had some uh, camera equipment in storage because before I started shooting video, I was taking just pictures. All I did was photography. And over some time, I had purchased a variety of Olympus and Panasonic lenses that were, uh, they were all prime lenses designed for uh, taking pictures. They're not, they're not video lenses. They're, they're not designed for taking video. So I, I haven't been using them and I put them in storage uh, before the pandemic. And then of course I got locked out of the country and all those lenses and a bunch of other stuff was sitting in storage here in Kuala Lumpur until quite recently. And I wanted to uh, sell these lenses and perhaps sell those lenses and the cameras I currently own and use and uh, use all that money, assuming I get any money, use that money to purchase a more suitable camera body and a more suitable camera lens. And I've been uh, procrastinating doing this, mainly because I'm a procrastinator, but also because selling anything for me is such an unpleasant experience. I hate doing it. It's always a pain. Each individual sale, like if you're selling something used to people, you know, you advertise what you have to sell. It can take you a very long time just to construct your advertisement. You know, you have to take nice pictures of your product, whatever it is you're selling, showing what it looks like and uh, the condition that it's in, whether there's any damage or wear and tear, you got to clean it up, make it presentable for the potential buyer. Then you've got to, you know, create the ad, write a description of it, upload that and all the photos to some sort of website where you had to create an account and then after that we have to start fielding all these inquiries from people asking you questions about the product all the other people offering you a ridiculously low price you know 10 percent of what you're asking and you, you you invest so much time communicating with these people and then you arrange to meet them and then after you make arrangements to meet them they don't show up or they cancel, or you meet them and they decide they don't want it and they don't buy it. I mean, you can lose a big, big chunk of your life doing this and it ends up feeling like such a waste of time. So there's been many periods in my life where I've had stuff. I bought it thinking, well, if I don't need it, I'll just sell it. And that's how I convinced myself to buy it in the beginning. But then when the time comes to sell it, I just don't bother. I just give it away or I leave it behind. You know, you just, you just walk out of whatever room you're in, just walk out of whatever apartment you're renting and just shut the door behind you. Whatever's in the place, you just leave it there. It's just too much of a hassle. It's not worth uh, trying to sell it. So I was dreading selling these lenses, but they are worth a significant amount of money. And I thought I might as well try to get something for them. And I started off going out to some camera stores here in uh, Kuala Lumpur. And I didn't have uh, much luck with that for various reasons. Um, yeah, every camera store, there was some kind of a problem. I was told originally, the very first place I went, that the market is flooded with used camera gear. Good grief. <laughs> These crazy people. Yeah, you couldn't see that, but there's a gas station here and there's a car trying to decide what to do. And the car ended up parking with two thirds of his, the butt end of the car sticking out into this very busy road. 
with a bus barreling towards us. And I didn't want to get anywhere near him because he sees me and he's not moving, he's not dangerous, but the dude's gonna get rear-ended. And when he gets rear-ended, his car's gonna come flying towards me. So I, I kept my distance and yeah, I don't know why you would stop your car in the middle of the road like that, especially a road like this. This is a really dangerous one. Very narrow laneways, fast moving traffic. Yeah, I'm usually riding my bike up and down this road. It's a pretty, uh, I think it has a bike lane on both sides, but the bike lane is really horrible. It's not really a lane at all. They just basically turn, they just said, okay, we'll make the sidewalk a bike lane. Sometimes it's on the street, sometimes it's on the sidewalk, and it's a... Uh, And then it goes across, like even when it's a bike lane, it goes across an exit like this one. And if you're cycling along, not paying attention, you think you're safe because you're in the bike lane, you're still gonna get killed because all these cars will just come racing along and turn, make a sudden turn right down that lane. And all the people on scooters and motorcycles, they use the bike lane for shortcuts. If the traffic is backed up or there's traffic ahead of them, the motorcycle will just hop into the bike lane and hit the throttle and try to race ahead of the cars to cut in front of them. So you're dealing with that danger. And then of course, most of the bike lanes in Kuala Lumpur, they're just filled with delivery trucks, taxis, parked cars. They're just uh, completely filled with uh, parked vehicles anyway. So they aren't much used for cycling. Anyway, yeah, it's a crazy road here. So yeah, the first camera store, they were telling me that because of the pandemic, the economic hardships, everybody losing their jobs, uh, having no money, everybody for the last three years has been selling their used camera gear. And uh, this guy, you know, his shop was just filled, packed to the brim, he said, with all kinds of used camera equipment that he can't sell. So he, he won't buy for cash anything. Like he would not buy any lenses from me. If I wanted to trade in, you know, I could take my old lenses and use their value towards purchasing a new camera or another lens from him, but he wouldn't give me any money for the lenses. And we tried to strike a deal because he actually said he had a camera body that I was interested in, but then several weeks went by waiting and waiting and waiting to hear back from this guy you keep contacting him and say, oh, I haven't had time to look yet. I don't, I haven't had time to look yet. And I finally went back one more time to uh, finally find out what the heck is going on. So I went back to this place in person and then he says, well, I don't think I even have that camera. I thought I did, but I can't find it. So that was the end of that. Wasted all that time waiting for him to do something. Other places I went to, they said the lenses I have are kind of a niche item. My Olympus and Panasonic lenses for the Micro Four Thirds format. Like nobody in, in uh, or few people in Malaysia use that type of camera gear. Everyone here wants Sony. Like Sony is the, uh, the, big, the big boy on the block. Everyone's attracted to Sony cameras. So they want Sony. If I had a used Sony lens, that would be fine, but they're not interested in uh, used uh, Olympus lenses. So I ran into a dead end there. In other places, to be honest, they were just rude. Uh, rude and abrupt and unfriendly, all the uh, store clerks. And that's a pretty uh, common experience uh, that I found in, in Asia in general. I don't know why it happens, but all these camera store, like the places I like to go, technology shops, either a camera store, computer store, or even like a technical camping store or cycling store, things like that. Those places, for whatever reason, tend to have the worst customer service. So I think what happens is young men in particular end up as store clerks there, and they're hired because they're passionate about whatever it is the product is. So all these camera stores end up with clerks who know a lot about cameras, or at least they think they know a lot about cameras, because it's their hobby. But just the fact that photography is their hobby doesn't make them good sales clerks, you know? 
Uh, customer service is more about personality, more about a desire to help people, more about, you know, skills in dealing with other human beings and all these hobbyist photographers, computer geeks, they're the worst at it. It's just not what they do. And at the same time, in an odd twist, in most of these countries, of course, I have to find a place where they speak English well, or at least well enough to communicate. And uh, there's a lot of English, of course, in Malaysia. And before this, I was living in Taiwan. And uh, much less English is spoken in Taiwan, of course. But there are people who speak English, and I would find a store where they did speak English. And yet, in, that, in, in Malaysia and in Taiwan, the places that have the, wor the lowest English levels are always technology places. So even if you do find a, you know, a camera store where the young guy is smiling and friendly and willing to help you, chances are, out of all the stores you could possibly visit, that's the store where none of the clerks speak English at all. And uh, yeah, so I went to a bunch of places and they're all rather unfriendly. I'm not going to say that they're, you know, they're, I'm sure they're wonderful people. Um, if you met any of these guys in real life, and I'm sure they're normal, happy, friendly people. Their friends love them. Their mother loves them. They're, they're good friends, good sons, good boyfriends, whatever their role is in life. I'm sure they're wonderful people. But somehow, when it comes to me walking into their store and saying, yeah, I have some uh, Olympus lenses I'd like to sell or trade in on something that you carry here, they don't exactly come across brimming with enthusiasm or helpfulness or even any interest at all. They don't want to share any kind of a personal moment with you. They're, they're, just, they're very technical. They're all about money, basically. Like, what do you want to buy? If you want to buy something, buy it. If you don't, get out of my store. You know, that's the kind of the attitude you run into quite a bit in uh, technology stores. And maybe they're pushed in that direction by customers in general, because customers, yeah, they are pretty serious about prices. I guess haggling is a big deal in Asia. I never haggle, I can't be bothered. Just tell me what the price is, I'll either pay it or I won't pay it. But I'm not gonna sit here and you know bargain with you over it. Just tell me what you think it's worth, and if I don't think it's worth that, I'll go somewhere else. I, I don't like bargaining. But people here do bargain, it's part of the culture. And people worry about price a lot, so maybe customers have trained the clerks to think only about the price. And I, I kind of want more of a personal back and forth with them. I want to talk about the lenses, talk about what I do with the camera gear that I'm looking for, find out what their experience is with cameras, what they think of this, that, the other. I want to have a chat with the guy, but that's a very difficult thing to find. Anyway, I'm at uh, McDonald's and I'm going to pop inside and uh, place an order for breakfast. I use the uh, touch screen to order out there. I love doing that now. Just, uh, t -t 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 -t. And then paying with uh, an e, you know, touch and go e-wallet. I love that whole system. And then you take a, a table number, a little plastic T or a plastic A-frame shaped label with a table number on it. And you, know, you put it on your table and, and they bring your order right to you wherever you are really fast and efficient system. I love it. So I just got a uh, tea, tea Turek and um, sausage McMuffin with egg for uh, six ringgit. Six, I guess everything included, six and a half ringgit with taxes comes to that. So it's really nice. Uh, and I guess one great thing about a place like McDonald's when it comes to a competitive edge with regular companies is that everything is so consistent. I mean, the very first time I came here, um, yeah, with, with a Planet Doug subscriber actually, uh, she brought me to this place. It was one of her favorite McDonald's. And we met up here and uh, just had breakfast and we were chatting. And I got a tea Tarek at one point and it was nice it was tasty and hot like super super hot like clearly the water you know just was, was boiling just a minute ago and every time i've come here it's been the exact same hot cup of good tasting tea 
And then the Egg McMuffins are, the sausage Egg McMuffins are always so good. And, and you know exactly what you're getting every time you come here. Of course, you go to a new local place. Of course, you have all the excitement of going to a new place. And, you know, it's, it's a surprise and it's interesting. But, you know, nine times out of ten for me, the hot drink is not hot enough, no matter what the drink is. So it's always a little bit uh, disappointing from that point of view. Ah. Anyway, I was talking about my experience at, this is sort of a general thing. I, I, I don't want to exaggerate how, you know, I don't, want, I don't want to exaggerate how unpleasant it can be for me, you know, going into camera stores and computer stores. A lot of it has to do with my expectations. I go in there on edge to begin with, sort of anticipating the worst, hoping for a really nice, warm interaction with the person in the store. And then I'm always badly disappointed and, and it just, it's always an unpleasant experience to the point that now I kind of dread going to them more and more. And all of this was true in a general sense up until yesterday. And yesterday I came across a camera store that I now absolutely love. I had such a great experience going there. And I might have gotten lucky in a way, and I'll tell the story in a minute about how I got lucky. Um, the place is called Alltech Camera. Alltech or Alltech Camera. Um, it's inside, it's on the sixth floor of the Berjaya Times Square building. There's a cluster of camera stores up there on the sixth floor. They, they do a lot of, um, they sell new gear, of course, but they also specialize in trade-ins and uh, second-hand gear as well. And uh, it was up there. I'd actually been to a number of the stores up on the sixth floor, and I'd had from, you know, disappointing to negative experiences with most of them. And I'd walked by Alltech a number of times, but it's right. It was right on my way. It was like tucked away in a corner of the sixth floor, and I would walk by it, and I'd had such a negative experience at all the other camera stores that I never screwed up my courage to go into uh, Alltech. It was like one more camera store, and I just couldn't face it. I just couldn't face the experience of going into another one. And they had a kind of a table at the front blocking the main entrance with some chairs there. And I didn't see any clerks like in the vicinity. So like, it wasn't a store. You couldn't go into the store and walk around the aisles. You know, it's a very small place. And what you do is sit at the table at the entrance and then the clerks will go get things and you can sit down in these chairs and they'll talk to you at the table. But just from a first time visit point of view, I didn't like that layout because I, I, you know, I couldn't even go into the store. It looked like there was a barrier right at the entrance. And I just took one look at that barrier and all the times I went to Burjaya Times Square, I just walked right past Alltech. I never went inside until yesterday because I was online looking for camera stores again, looking for another place I could go, another place I could try. And I looked at the Google Maps reviews for Alltech. You know, I clicked on the listing for Alltech on Google Maps and people leave reviews and people just raved about the place. And they were talking about all the things that are important to me. They weren't saying, you know, no, they did talk about this, but they weren't focusing on you know cheap price, anything like that. They were focusing on how friendly the people were, how helpful they were, how good the customer service was, how reliable they were, how trustworthy they were, how dependable they were. It was my language. All the reviews were speaking my language. So I thought, okay, you know, I should give this place a try. And then I, I found some um, listings on Carousel from Alltech because they sell a lot of used gear and they, they list a lot of it or all of it on a carousel. And when I'm scanning, I, I found that they, they sold some of the things I was interested in as well as the things I was selling. So they'd be familiar with these products. And then I saw that they had a WhatsApp number and there was a name there, you know, Alan with a WhatsApp number. And I thought, huh, maybe instead of just going there, and risking rejection, let's try to smooth 
the process out a little bit. Maybe I can contact them in advance through WhatsApp and then we can have a bit of a friendly back and forth. I can tell them in writing what it is I'm trying to do, ask them questions, and I can establish some kind of a relationship with them before I go there. Because I said, I'm so nervous now about going to these stores because it can you know, ruin my whole day when someone is mean to me. I, I hate it. <laughs> or I perceive them as being mean to me. So I try to you know, make things as controlled as possible. And by the way, if I'm making even less sense this morning than I normally do, I can blame it on fatigue. It was last night. Um, I, I don't know what was going on or where it was coming from, but I think it was the neighbor of the hotel where I'm staying, you know, the neighboring building of the Kojoy. For whatever reason, they decided to get out industrial drills and drill holes through concrete right on the other side of my room, starting, starting, not ending, starting at two in the morning. So I was in bed sleeping, I woke up, and I woke up to the sound, like right above my bed, the sound of a drill trying to drill through concrete. And I know what that sounds like because I've had to deal with this construction noise um, all the time that I've been living in Asia. I find it's very common for people to renovate their buildings and they're basically tearing down concrete walls and they have to use jackhammers and heavy duty drills to do it. And the, the, the usual thing in this part of the world, in my experience, is they just do it anytime they want. It makes no difference, day or night, Sunday morning, seven, six in the morning, you know, the jackhammers start. And uh, I've lived through months of jackhammering like one of these renovations like where they gut an entire building and turn it into something else can lead to weeks and even months of jackhammering as they break down all the concrete walls on the inside so once you hear that jackhammer start up you wonder like it could last a weekend could be a small job but it could go on for weeks and even the entire summer you know nothing but this incredibly loud jackhammering early in the morning, late at night. There don't seem to be any bylaws about you know, when you can make this kind of noise. So I've learned to live with it. But yeah, that, even for me though, that was a surprise last night. Two in the morning, they started drilling. And um, there was, it drilled for a while, woke me up. And I thought, huh, that's weird. And then it stopped. And I thought, oh, okay, I can go back to sleep. You know, maybe they just hung a, hung a picture on the wall and they needed to do it at two in the morning and they drilled one hole or something. And I tried to go back to sleep, but then they started up again. And it went on until five in the morning, from two until five. They just drilled all through the night. And I, I just turned on the light. I took a shower, made a cup of coffee and fired up my computer. And I never even tried to go back to sleep after that. So I'm, I'm running on like zero sleep. Everything ended well with all tech, and I'll, I'll tell that whole story eventually, but I have to say it did not get off to a good start um, because I was really depending on that message I wrote on WhatsApp to establish some kind of relationship, and I wrote out in full, like a full detailed list of every camera lens I had for sale, like a very clear detailed list of everything I was trying to sell and I asked them, um, you know, are you interested in any, like this type of lens? Because I'd like to use them as trade-in to purchase this camera. And I knew they sold the camera I was interested in. And I told them, okay, I'm interested in the Olympus OMD EM5 Mark III. And, you know, this is what I'm trying to do. Like, let me know if you're interested and, you know, where we go from here. And I suppose I'm my own worst enemy again because I have a habit of providing too much information. You know, maybe I was listing the things I wanted to sell and the thing I wanted to buy in the same message, and even two things in one message. It's too much for most people in the world. I don't know why it is, but one message has to have one question. <laughs> Otherwise, it w you know, if, you, if you include even two questions, one question they may answer, and the other question they'll just ignore entirely. They'll pick one out of your list of questions and they'll answer one of them and ignore all the rest. 
It's just what people do. I've never understood it, but it's a human habit. But anyway, I sent off this very detailed, very friendly, you know, very well-organized message. And a few hours went by, which is fine. These places are usually quite busy. They're not going to reply instantly. And in, in fact, I thought so much time passing was a good sign because they must be going through my list of lenses and figuring out in their head, like, okay, are we interested in this lens? Yes, no, hmm, how much maybe it's worth, depending on the condition it's in. And maybe they're mentally putting together a detailed reply about, yes, we, we are interested in this, 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 this lens, and we might be able to pay you this much. And yes, we can do a trade in, but bring your lenses in, we'll look at them, you know, uh, judge their condition. And, you know, and then we can go from there. That's, that's the reply I was expecting. And then, yeah, hours later, um, I got a reply, one line that said, um, Olympus OMD EM5, price must order. And that was it. That was the entire reply. The name of the camera that I was interested in, they quoted the price that they were selling it at, and then they said two words at the end, must order. And that was the, the only reply I got. I thought maybe it would be just the first one and I would be getting more information. So I waited, had a cup of coffee, and I'm looking at my phone like, come on, come on, give me a friendly message. I need more information than that. What about all the lenses I'm trying to sell? Like, tell me something. And I waited and waited. Nope, that was it. There no, no other, I got no other message. And this uh, upset me, I must say, um, really annoyed me. It was like one more camera store, like just sort of a slap in the face. And I was uh, so upset, to be honest, that for a brief minute or two, I contemplated replying with some heat. You know, I was going to write back to this guy and sort of, you know, <laughs> I was upset. And I was going to write a message to let him know that I was upset about this, what I thought was a very rude and abrupt and unfriendly message, you know, that I got from him. But one thing I've learned in my time, in my life, is that you never do anything in anger. I mean, sure, you could if you wanted to. You may be justified in replying with something negative, you know, to point, to criticize. But don't do it when you're angry. Like, wait, just sleep on it. You know, let something sit and then wake up the next morning and then you can reply. And usually by the next morning, you don't even care anymore. You know, you've even forgotten what happened. So I, I've, I've developed that habit. And the other thing about, again, you know, being overseas, I've, I've talked about this before. It is a risk that you generalize. So I've been to like, not, not just here in Kuala Lumpur, but my entire life in, in Southeast Asia. I've been to so many bicycle shops, camera stores, camping stores, where I thought people were very unfriendly and kind of rude and unhelpful. Happens all the time. But each time this happens, it kind of builds up inside me, right? It, like it might happen like this time, five, six, seven shops in a row. And then this guy sends this unfriendly message and then I give him a blast back but it's a like it's anger that has built up over all these other stores you know he didn't do anything so terrible and yet all this anger and frustration has been building up and you end up taking some poor guy and just hitting him with all of it all at once you know it's sort of like you know, if you're driving or something and then all these drivers are cutting you off and doing different things. And then finally one more person cuts you off or does something dumb. And then you've got all this anger built up from all the other people who did it, right? So the poor guy, the last one, you know, the, uh, the, the last straw, basically, you end up aiming all your anger at this one person but all this anger is built up over a long period of time. So you have to be careful about that. You shouldn't uh, generalize when you get angry. So I did this, you know, Zen thing, you know, just like, oh, just let it go, let it go. And I decided to write back, but I was only going to write back with a, another question. Like I said, I, I kind of asked two questions. I, I'm interested in buying this camera and I have these lenses for trade-in but he only replied about the camera. 
and he told me how much it cost. And uh, so he only replied to one question out of my two. So I thought, oh, okay, well, I'll just ask. I'll send him another message repeating my initial question. So I wrote back to him and uh, just wrote out, you know, oh, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I know, actually, I, I, I told him I knew how much that camera cost because I could see they're listening on Carousel. I already knew what they were asking for that camera. So I didn't even need that information. But what about all the lenses that I have for sale? Or is anything here of interest to you? So I just sort of repeated my second question and sent it as a second message. And then I got another reply to that, you know, where the guy basically said, you know, you have to bring everything into our store, then we can look at it, and then we can see, you know, how much it might be worth or whether we're interested in it or not. And then I wrote back and said, well, how, like, when is a good time? Like, tomorrow morning, you know, can you suggest a time? Because I really want things to be as organized as possible, because I don't want things to go wrong, and to my delight, he wrote back and said, you know, 11.30 tomorrow morning is a good time. So I was like, yes. I finally dragged out of him a normal back and forth, you know, where we were sharing information. And I now had an appointment, you know, to show up at 11.30 in the morning. So I was so happy about that. I'm back outside now. I was going to stay in McDonald's longer, but, uh, <laughs> not to complain about people more, but there, there was almost nobody in the McDonald's. It was very quiet in there, so I was speaking very, very quietly, and I found a table in the back, way in the back corner, so I wouldn't be disturbing anyone. But there happened to be one other man back there sitting at a nearby table, and the entire time that he was sitting there, he was hawking up like clearing his throat. I guess he's developing a cold or something, but he was like, like, <laughs> like sucking up the phlegm and then breathing through his nose. Like, oh, it's like, it was absolutely disgusting. I just couldn't take it anymore. It's just another behavior I, I don't understand. There's so many things that people do, you know, that humans do. And I always wonder, it's like, aren't you aware of your surroundings? He was hawking and snorting and sucking up all his phlegm so loudly. He has to know that everyone around him could hear him doing this the entire time that he was sitting there. He must know. How can he not be aware? But he didn't care. So he, you know, me, if I were suffering from a cold like that, I would probably not go to McDonald's to begin with or you know, I would go to the bathroom and blow my nose quietly and discreetly in the corner somewhere where I'm not uh, bothering anyone and then go back to my table. I'm not going to just sit there sniffing and horking and flemming. <laughs> I just couldn't take it anymore. I had to leave. So, yeah, I left. Yeah, I was telling the story of uh, my trip to Altec Camera, which I should emphasize again was a wonderful experience. Can't recommend this place enough. You need computer gear, go to Burjaya Times Square, sixth floor, look for all tech camera, but ask for Alan, the owner, Alan. He's the guy you want to talk to. And I'll talk about why in a minute. It's part of the story. But it was Alan that I was communicating with. And I, I've realized through experience that there's a certain type of older, older gentleman that can be extremely friendly and personable in person, but they're just not that happy writing messages. Like they're not, they're not part of the WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger culture. So their messaging can come across less friendly than they are in real life. And I think that's what uh, happened here in terms of how his initial message to me was kind of terse and abrupt and ignored almost everything that I wrote. And all he wrote back was how much the camera cost. You know, as I said, there is this emphasis in all these technology stores on the price. Because I think, as I said, I think customers do this too. They shoot themselves in the foot. We do as customers, because people have the habit of going, they want to buy something and they want to get it at the cheapest price. So they go into a store and they walk in the door and say, okay, Sony A6400, how much? 
and the guy tells them and they go out go to the next store a64 sony how much how much and then they they get they then they go to the place that has the cheapest price so maybe that's what they think customers want and i'm less about the price and i'm more about customer service anyway i had an i had a set time to go to Alltech camera, 11.30 the next morning. I was very happy about that. I got all my gear ready. I double checked everything. Someone else that I don't understand at all. These guys with their stupid motorcycles, 125 cc engine, but he has it set up with an exhaust that is so loud that everyone within a kilometer, a square kilometer can hear him as he rides past. Why do they do that? I have no idea, no, but again, that's something else that humans do. Uh, yeah, gave all my gear another look, cleaned everything, made sure everything was organized, packaged properly so that I could show it. I made new lists that I could show on my phone, you know, of everything that I'm trying to sell with all the details about it. I went online and find out, found out what this stuff was selling for, used to try and get an idea of how much I could hope to get. So if he does make me an offer, I can judge whether it's a good offer or not. Did all that, and then I got ready for the next morning. Yeah, doing a trade-in deal is a little bit odd too, because you're not gonna get the best price because I'm selling my gear, I'm hoping to sell my gear to a store and they have to sell it again to make a profit. That's what they're there to do, right? They're not, they don't wanna, they're not buying the lens from you because they want to use it. They're buying the lens from you because they want to sell it again and make a profit. So right out of the gate, the amount that you can expect for them to offer you will be lower than what a person would offer you, you know? So could be, I don't know, maybe if I sold my lenses privately on carousel or something or on ebay maybe i could get twice as much as i could get on a trade-in deal something like that who knows but of course to do that you have to sell every lens individually one at a time to an individual person and that could take weeks even months to do so if you go to a store a trade-in at a camera store they will give you a lot less for what you're selling, but they may also buy everything you've got all at once. One trip and you're done. So that's very attractive. So I went to uh, Alltech, 11.30 the next morning. And from that point on, everything was wonderful. I met Alan, the owner. I believe he's the owner of Alltech. He's the, uh, the senior guy there in any event. And he was the one I was messaging with. He's, he spoke enough English that we could communicate easily. And uh, <laughs> though, yeah, as, 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 as satisfactory as the whole exchange was, there were little issues here and there, which again, kind of make me tilt my head a little bit, wondering about people, you know, humans, the things they do. So, for example, there's Alan. I meet Alan, and he basically dealt with me as if he knew nothing about me. So I was like, well, I'm the guy you were messaging with, you know, for most of yesterday. I have all these lens, you know, I have all these uh, lenses to sell. And he's like, oh, oh, okay, uh, what do you have? And I'm like, well, I s you've got messages galore where I've listed everything in detail. You knew, you, I mean, it's, it's there, go look it up. What do I have? You know what I have. I already told you what I have. But I guess he never saw that part of the message or didn't even notice it, who knows. So anyway, I'm there and um, I'm taking all of my lenses out of the packaging I had it in, putting it on the table. And again, I had a certain expectation or a certain desire for how things would go. I like to do things slowly and methodically. I like things to be organized. But 
doesn't usually work that way in the real world, especially at a camera store, because for me, every lens that I was selling was like one of my babies. It was something I had agonized over when I purchased it, that I had used lovingly, owned for years, had so many stories associated with every lens. I can remember using it in so many different situations and places. It's a very personal thing for me. Each one of these lenses was just so important to me. But for these guys at Alltech, of course, it's just a commodity. They, uh, they have, they're not emotionally invested in any of this. All they want to do is look at it, judge its condition, and, and tell me a price. So the whole thing was rather impersonal, put it that way. And there were like two, two clerks there. It turns out Alan, being older, I guess, his eyesight isn't that good anymore, so he can't really judge the condition of the lenses. And he hands them off to the young guys, the young clerks in the store. And the young clerks, of course, are young and perfect vision, and they, they know about, uh, they're trained, I guess, they have a lot of experience in judging things. And the main thing they're looking for in Malaysia is fungus, because I've talked about this before, camera lenses, uh, fungus grows inside the lenses, particularly if you don't use them for a while. And of course, my lenses have been sitting in storage, and um, there was a risk, you know, that fungus had grown inside the lenses, and these guys just very, very quickly grabbed all the lenses one by one, and they had their smartphones down on the counter in front of them with the, with the flashlight turned on, and they use that as their light source, you know, to look through the lens and look for fungus, and they, they know exactly what they're looking for. But anyway, they look for fungus, they look over the condition of the lens, and then they consult their online listings, what they have in stock already. You know, there might be a lens that's in perfectly good condition, fungus-free, and yet they don't want it because they already have five of those lenses in stock or something. But anyway, within seconds, they, were, they, were go they just grabbed everything out of the box and were just sort of like, <laughs> you know. And it was moving so fast, it was like it was, again, spinning out of control. And then almost instantly, the best lens I have, the nicest one that I own, they just put it back in my box and says, yeah, we're not interested in that one, and we're not interested in that one. And it, they just started rejecting things, like right out of the gate. And it's, it's kind of weird because for them, it's just a commercial transaction. This lens, for whatever reason, we don't think we can sell it, so we're not interested in buying it. And they say, yeah, not this one. But for me, it feels like a personal rejection that they are telling me that my lens is crap. You know, yeah, we're not interested in that piece of garbage. You know, that's what it feels like. It's not, they just think they can't sell that lens for whatever reason. And yet that lens has meant so much to me, it feels almost like an insult to be rejected so quickly, just like right out of the gate. Nah, not that one, nah, not that one. All these things that hold so much value to you these strangers just sort of like, nah, forget it. We're not interested. And that's what happened at all the other camera stores initially. However, um, I had a lot. I had a lot of gear I wanted to sell. So I said to Alan, because I could tell it was going to take a long time. And they had other customers to deal with. So I said, well, why don't I just leave all this stuff here with you? I'll go get a cup of coffee. You know, I'll come back in an hour and then we can see where we are. And he says, okay, that's fine, fine, fine. And I went off to Starbucks, had a coffee, and an hour later I went back, and there were two piles. There was a pile of my gear in a box, the stuff they couldn't sell, and then there was a pile over here. A, uh, a very, I was very happy to see quite a large pile that they were interested in. And then Alan came over with a sheet of paper and he sat down with me and he went through all the items one by one and told me what his offer was for each one. And yeah, I was quite happy. It's like, I don't, again, in, in that case, I don't think there was a lot of room for haggling because all the power was on his side, I think, as the camera store. Um, he doesn't really need any of this stuff. And if I say, oh no, that's not enough, uh, and I ask for more, he'd probably just say, well, 
that's my offer and that's what I think I, uh, that's what I can give you for it. And uh, if that's not enough for you, that's fine. You know, you can keep it or go somewhere else. You know, I'm pretty sure he was not going to uh, be open to a lot of haggling. And to be honest, I wasn't interested in haggling because all of this stuff was dead weight to me. I wasn't using it and I was never going to use it again. So uh, it had no value to me monetarily at all. And almost anything anybody offered me, I'd be happy to get because it's certainly, it's better than nothing, right? And I did not want to leave there carrying this stuff and having to try to sell it to someone else. Like if he's making me an offer and the offer is even remotely reasonable, done deal. Yes, I agree. And I was selling so many things that by the time he added up all the amounts for each item, to be honest, is a little bit on the low side, I think. But that's to be expected, as I said, because he has to make a profit reselling it. And he's taking a risk because he offers a guarantee. Like if you sell your lens to a private individual, that's the end of the transaction or, or a camera body, whatever it is you're selling. They walk away with the camera gear, you have the money and that's the end of the transaction. It's all done. But he sell, he, when he resells it, he offers like a one year or two year guarantee to his customers. So he, he could end up in a situation where the customer he sells it to isn't happy, has a problem with it, returns it, wants their money back, they have to repair it. You know, it could be a huge um, hassle for him. And uh, I don't know if I said this already or not, but they were interested in so many items that by the time you added up what he was offering for all of the items, for me, it was a significant amount of money. I basically had a box of lenses that were useless to me, and he was offering me all this money in exchange for them. Once you added it all together is what I'm saying. So I was uh, quite happy with that, and I said yes. Look at that. There's the uh, Kojoy down in the corner. And I was talking about all the signs that I saw down at the lower levels, but they also put them up at the top. The very the peak on the face the part of the hotel facing me, you can see that logo there. And then on the front facing the park, it says Hotel Kojoy with the logo again. So they have a uh, yeah, the signs there from uh, top to bottom. And looking at that sign, uh, I have to say it probably means the drilling that I that kept me up all night was probably was coming from the code joy, because you can see those signs. They're all being held in place by steel bolts that have been drilled through the concrete. So that they were probably putting that sign up there. Why they did it at uh, two in the morning, that I can't tell you, but that's probably what was going on. Because my room is right there right beside that, uh, the window to my room is right beside that sign. Though it sounded like it was coming from the other side of the wall. Eh, weird, anyway. <laughs> That's part of the deal of me staying at the Kojoy, by the way, that I, I got a very good rate to stay there, partially because all of this construction would be going on. So that, that's part of the deal that everything would be, you know, there would be construction and renovation going on all around me while I'm staying there. So, and as I said, I'm used to this sort of thing anyway. The sound of jackhammering and drilling through concrete, to me, that's like birds chirping in the morning. I, that's what you wake up to all the time in Southeast Asia. I'm very accustomed to it. Yeah, hotel's looking really nice. And the Winson sign is down. There used to be big signs here on the side of the building that said uh, Winson. And they've been taken down. So it just says uh, Kojoy everywhere now. Look at that. And as I said, I started this whole arrangement because there were some things I was interested in purchasing. And I was going to use my lenses as you know, a trade-in for these other items. But because I had so much gear that I was selling, we sort of kept it really simple where he was just gonna look at all my gear, give, quote me a price on everything he's interested in, give me the money 
as a one, one, that's one transaction. Now we're done with that. And then I could then take that money and give it back to him by buying things in his store. Um, like the normal thing is you, you trade in something, he tells you how much it's worth, and then they deduct that amount from the price of the thing you're buying. But in this case, they couldn't really do that because I got a lot more money than I needed to buy the items I was buying. So basically we divided into separate transactions. He gave me the cash for everything I was selling him. And then I bought a couple of things, very exciting. This is something I've been talking about for a long time and I think would be very useful. This is the Rode Wireless Go 2. And uh, it's a bit, a bit of a risk buying this right now because it has been out for a while and I have a feeling that Rode may release the Rode Wireless Go 3. You know, who knows? I, you know, that always happens to me. I'll buy something and then a month later they release the new version, which has big, you know, so many improvements over the previous one. But yeah, at some point you have to take a chance and uh, I bought this. So the big advantage to this, like right now I'm using the Rode Wireless Go microphone and here it is, as always, I have the microphone here and a receiver on the camera. The advantage to this, the new one, is that there are two microphones. They both connect to the same receiver. So for example, if I'm having breakfast with Daryl, Wander Eats Daryl, and or I'm having, you know, I'm hanging out with someone that I've met, I can put a microphone on me and a second microphone on them. So basically it's recording both our voices on the same video track. And that's the whole point to this one. Um, to be honest, there's no, there's no point doing an unboxing because you can see what it looks like. It looks exactly like this, except there are now two of them. And uh, that's the box right there. But as I said, yeah, there's no point uh, doing any kind of an unboxing because, yeah, I know exactly, I know what's inside there. You know what's inside there. It looks exactly like that, except that there's more of them. But the other thing I was interested in buying, much more exciting, and maybe I will, I will open this on camera while I'm sitting here drinking my coffee, and that is, let me put this out of the way, and that is the Insta360 X3. The new version, because uh, I have, I used to have the Insta360 ONE X2 360 camera, and it's a great little camera, but Insta360 released the new version of it and they made major improvements. So this is much better. The X3 is a big improvement for me, a big improvement over the X2. The basic idea is that the image quality is roughly the same. Same sensor, uh, all the same processor. So the image quality might be a little bit better, but generally the same as the X2. So you're not getting better video quality, but they made the camera much more user friendly. They put a really large touch screen on the front and then they changed up all the buttons and the controls and they added a lot of new features in the uh, software. So that is the uh, Insta360 X3. And I sold him as part of the trade-in deal, my Insta360 ONE X2. And I essentially got this camera at half price because half the price of this he knocked off in exchange for trading in the X2, basically. Um, so yeah, it works out to a very good deal for me. For a brief moment, I thought about keeping both of them. That's another side. I mean, if you're trading in something, you may be offered such a low amount of money as part of the trade-in that, well, you might as well just pay full price and keep them both and then you have two 360 cameras. You know, I already own the X2, then I'm not getting a huge amount of money for it, perhaps. So I thought, well, maybe I can just buy this one and keep the other one, and then I'll have two 360 cameras. And I considered that, but to be honest, I couldn't think of any situation where I'd ever want to use two of them. You know, maybe one of them 
just for uh, battery life. You know, if the batteries are all dead on this one, I can switch to the other one, which will have fresh batteries. But that's kind of silly because you can just buy an extra battery, you know, much cheaper than having a second camera. So in the end, I decided now it was better to trade in the old one and just buy the new one. So I don't think I'm going to do a full unboxing and go over this thing in detail, but just for fun, let's open this up and uh, take a look at it because I haven't seen it. Um, because of the new screen and the new power requirements, you had to get a new battery as well. And with all the new features, it is larger than the X2. Not by a lot, but it is bigger and heavier than the X2. And that's one thing I'm a little bit concerned about. So I do want to take a look at it myself just to see what's going on. <laughs> so beautiful. Look at that. The X3, very, very space age. Yeah, thinking about the trade-in deals, for this one, um, there was one unexpected element to it, and I guess that's something to consider. If you're dealing with just a camera body or a camera lens, it's relatively simple. Here's the lens, and then you get the money for the lens, and you're done. But something I hadn't counted on when I made all these plans is that with cameras like these, like with a GoPro, an action camera of any kind, like 50% or maybe even double you, it, it, the value is in the accessories, right? And I, for, I kind of forgot about that because I've got the One X, the, the One X2, trading it in on the One X3. And when I did the math in my head, it was like, wow, that's a really good deal. I might as well do that, trade that in, get the money for it, and invest the money in the new version. That works out really well for me. But it uses different batteries, different everything. So none of my accessories for the X2 work with the X3. And the way this works, I find out, I find in the camera world, is that you as the customer, when you buy a new camera, you are willing to pay for the camera, and then you are willing to pay full price for all the accessories. And by the time you're done, the set of accessories you need almost equals the price of the camera. But when you go to sell that back to a dealer, to a camera store, they're not interested in the accessories. They are only interested in the camera. And you can have all the accessories in the world and you can tell them how much you paid for all of them and how much they're worth as a group. They don't really care. Um, they'll take the accessories off your hands and include it in the, in the bundle, but they're not going to give you extra money for it. it. may give you a little bit of money for it, but generally for accessories, all the money you spent is gone. You're not going to get your money back in my experience. It's just the way things work. But now that I have the X3, I have to buy those accessories all over again. So in fact, by the time we were done, I spent more money, quite a bit more money than I had wanted to because I had to buy, I got the camera at a good price based on the trade-in, but now I had to buy extra battery, battery chargers, uh, microphone adapter, lens covers, lens cases, because all of these things from the X2, which I already had, they don't fit on the X3. It's a completely different design. So in fact, the price, I was a little, I was sitting there in the store and I was talking to Alan. So, oh yeah, I need, uh, I wouldn't mind getting an extra battery and then the battery charger. Oh yeah, and I'm going to need the mic adapter. And he started bringing all these boxes, putting on the table and he's got his calculator out, you know, it's like plus, uh, plus. And I saw the price go up and up and up and I went, oh boy, maybe, maybe I shouldn't do this after all. But then I remembered all of the huge improvements in this camera and I thought, okay, let's say, yeah, let's just do it. Anyway, let's pull that out. Wow. Man, you cannot complain about the build quality of these things. That is a brick. Wow. That's it. I'm using a GoPro right now and here in low light, you're not going to get a very good view of this thing. But uh, there's the basic thing. And I can feel it in my hands. 
it is significantly heavier than the X2. It's funny, when you look at the numbers for these things, you look at the number, how much one camera weighs or one camera lens weighs versus another, and you think, well, that's only 100 grams heavier. That's not a big deal, or 150 grams or whatever it is. And, but then when you hold it in your hand, it's like, ooh, oh yeah, that's a lot heavier. You know, it makes a bigger difference. Ooh, yeah, that's a much, much heavier camera than the X2. <laughs> and the only reason that's an issue, it's not, not for holding it like this, but if you're riding a scooter or a bicycle and now it's at the end of a selfie stick, you know, any extra weight makes a big difference in terms of the, the stick bouncing up and down. And I can see that weight. So that's something to think about. Hopefully it still works out in the end. So yeah, I'm going to dive in and uh, do some setting up, I think. But yeah, there's the, there's the camera there. Beautiful. And the, here are some of the um, accessories that I bought. You know, even the, uh, even the lens cap is different. Very, it's not an expensive item, but I had to get a new lens cap. And an extra battery for the X3. Not, not compatible with the X2, so. And then I had to buy a new mic adapter to be able to plug in a Rode Wireless Go uh, microphone. So each in each thing, and then I got a uh, fast charging hub. This one I'm curious about because, I don't know, it feels heavy. And I thought maybe it must include another battery. I thought it included a hub and a battery, but then when I saw it in the store, it didn't seem to uh, include an extra battery. But it feels like it has some weight to it, more than you would find in a, in a battery uh, charger. Took me a minute to open the box without tearing it to pieces. No, it looks like it's just the charger. Okay, that's a bit of a, <laughs> that's a chunky monkey. I wasn't expecting that. I honestly thought there was a charger and a battery in there. But yeah, it's designed for three. Yeah, that's a bit uh, disappointingly large and heavy. But the only other way to charge these batteries is inside the camera itself. And uh, it's just not a good idea over time to do that because these cameras, the um, lenses are very, very sensitive. And the less you handle the camera, like opening up the uh, USB-C port, plugging it in, and then you can, if you're plugging it in next to an outlet or something, then the camera has to be resting on the table or somewhere. And if you do that over time, eventually you're going to knock it off the table or drop something on it or forget to cover the lens or, or you're going to do something that's going to damage the lens. So I think having a battery charger is the wise move because then you can keep the camera safe in its packaging. And then all you do is, you know, you remove the battery and then, you know, put the battery in the charger. Yeah. Then you can charge uh, two of them at the same time. All right. So there you are. There's the uh, charging hub. And uh, luckily, the, um, the Ulanzi microphone mounting gizmo, that is the same for the X2 and the X3, so I didn't have to buy a new one of those. And I can use the, the Rode Wireless Go. I can use it with the uh, X3 as well. Well, I think that's all I'm going to uh, talk about for this morning and talk about uh, selling all my old uh, camera gear, which I'm very happy about, and uh, picking up a couple of items that I really wanted to get, mainly this one. To be honest, I, I could have been very happy just keeping the, one, the Insta360 ONE X2. That camera worked fine for my purposes and in terms of image quality, video quality, how the camera, what the camera actually records, I was perfectly happy with the X2. I don't think the X3 
adds greatly to that, but there are a lot of usability features which I think will make a, a big difference in the long run. The only downside I'm seeing now is the significantly larger camera body and um, the weight of it. I'm definitely going to miss how light and small the X2 was. Yeah, a lot of cameras go that route. GoPro did the same thing, right? When I compare, uh, this is the Hero 9 that I'm using. When I compare it to my old Hero 7, the difference in size is, is substantial. Um, the, by the time I put the 9 together inside the media mod, it's like twice the size of the Hero 7. So the Hero, the GoPros are, you know, expanding with every new model as well. And I, that just happens, I guess. I guess as customers, we are to blame for it because they release something and then all the customer feedback is, you know, what the camera is missing. Oh, we want longer battery life. Oh, we want this. We want that. And then they say, okay, we'll give you all those things. And then the camera ends up being, you know, 50% larger and heavier. And maybe we only have ourselves to blame for that. We should have been happy with what we had. Yeah, but hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully this works out. Actually, thinking of that, let me just put it on the selfie stick and then see what it uh, feels like for a second. Here's the uh, selfie stick. Just screws into the bottom. That feels fine. <laughs> That's a big difference. <gasps> yeah, I can feel it. Wow. Like once you have something at the end of a long stick like this, a, a little bit of extra weight amplifies how it feels, you know, because it's at the end of a long pole. It's workable still. It's doable. And to this weight, I'll be adding the uh, Rode Wireless Go microphone. You know, that's going to be added on top of the weight of the camera itself. So it's going to be even heavier than this. Boy, yeah, that's a, that's a big difference. So I guess that's uh, the one negative thing about this new camera, but hopefully that uh, I get used to that in short order. So that's it for this uh, little behind the scenes for this morning. I'm gonna sit down and get this set up and I have to learn all the new features here and I have to learn about all the new features here. So my two new toys. <laughs> It's going to be a fun day, and I will see you in the next video.